Hello everyone, welcome back for another lesson. In this lesson we will be talking about energy and energy efficiency. So first we must define what is energy. So it's the ability to do work either through a movement or mechanical work or make a change. For example, a chemical reaction would require energy in, or in order to happen. So what are the official units that we use when we talk about energy or when we measure and uh, when we measure energy? Um, it depends. If we are talking about a chemical reaction, we are measuring the energy in joules. But if we are talking about movement, which is more normally a physics type of topic, we will be talking about Newton per meter. That's the official unit. Okay, so it's how much force, which is measured in Newton, is um, is used over what distance. So how much force per unit of distance. So it depends, again, if we're talking about a chemical reaction or a movement, which is more of a physics situation. Now, there's a law of conservation of energy, a little bit like the law of conservation of matter. Nothing is created, nothing is lost. So we cannot create energy, we cannot lose energy. We can only transfer it or transform it, okay? So nothing ever disappears or comes out of thin air. So what is a transfer? It says that here it's a movement of energy from, from one place or another. So the energy is literally just traveling. A transformation, well, we have one form that is converted to another. So we know there's different forms of energy. Electricity could be one of them. Uh, radiant energy, so the sun, for example, or light is a type of radiant energy. Sounds um, uh, carry energy, and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, when we make machines, if you think of a car, for example, our machines are never perfect. There's always some energy that gets dissipated in the environment. If you put your hand on the top of the car, on the hood of the car, after it gets used, you will feel heat. And that amount of that energy is being released in the environment. It's not being used to do useful work, to move the car, for example. So our machines that we create are never perfect. Okay, so in the light of that, we need to calculate how efficient our machines are. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But first, if I give you examples of energy transfer, so an energy transfer, for example, would be uh, solar energy that makes its way from the sun to the plants. So again, a transfer is just energy that's moving from A to B. Thermal energy, so heat, is transferred from a cup that would be warm, so let's say it's containing hot chocolate, and if you have your hands around it, you're going to feel the heat, because the heat is going from the inside of the cup towards your hands. Now, it could be also that you have energy transformations. So, two examples here. We have electrical energy that's transformed into sound, so when you hear the school bell at the beginning of class or at the end of class, that's a transformation from electricity to sound. There's also radiant energy, electricity to um, light, right? The light bulb gets lit. Okay. So photosynthesis transforms solar energy into chemical energy. So, so when we study a system, uh, a reaction, for example, a situation, okay, so that's what we call a system, there's different types of systems we will encounter. A system could be open, like we have here. There's a beaker with a certain solution inside, and there's energy involved. Now, the energy is radiating outwards. So this, for example, would be exothermic. So this is open. Why? Because the energy can come out, and matter could also splatter, could also come out. Or if there's a gas created, the gas will go into the room. So this is totally open. Energy and matter can come in and out of the system that we're studying. Then we have a closed environment. So I have a lid on my beaker, so the energy can still radiate through the glass, but the matter stays inside the beaker. I cannot add anything. Obviously, I could lift the lid, but let's say I don't want to touch the lid. I can't add anything, and I can't take away any matter from that system. So this is a closed environment. But it's not good enough because it, the energy can still flow in and out. Then we have an insulator around the beaker. So we have an isolated system. So in this case, nothing can come in or out. Energy is stuck inside and matter is stuck inside and I cannot add energy and I cannot add matter. So this is basically a perfect situation if I want to study a system and see how energy behaves, for example. Is it 
endothermic? Is it exothermic? I can measure accurately because there's no outside source of matter that can come and skew my results. Okay, so we'll always try to use an isolated system when we study a certain situation because that's as close to perfect as uh, it can be. We're trying to literally isolate the situation that we're trying to study, the system that we're trying to study. So I was talking before about energy efficiency. So how do we calculate how good our machines are, our, our inventions, for example? Well, we have this fancy equation that says energy efficiency as a percentage is equal to the useful energy, so the amount of energy that does work, over the total consumed energy. So the total consumed energy is the part that did work, but it's also what went maybe in the environment in the form of heat. So we say energy loss, but we know that the law of conservation of um, energy says that we don't lose heat or we don't lose energy and we don't create any, it just gets transformed or transferred. So in this case, it's a misuse of the word. We say energy loss, but it's really energy that's transferred to the environment and that portion of energy did not perform any work. Now, since we're calculating a percentage, we need to multiply this by 100%. If you're anything like me, I prefer the other version where I can cross multiply, it's easier to solve. So you take the 100% and you bring it to the other side over here. So you have your two percentages together and you have your two uh, amounts of energies in joules together. Okay, so don't forget this in blue, I color coded it, it's your consumed or total energy. And basically what it is, it's your useful energy, the energy that did perform work and the excess or what we would call the heat loss. We know it's not loss for real, it's just transferred, but we call it that way. Okay, so don't forget it's both components together that create the consumed energy. Now, what would a problem look like? I actually have two for you. So here's the first one. The element of a stove has supplied 2,000 energy, a joule, sorry, of energy to a pot in order to boil water. If the water absorbed only 500 joules of heat energy, what is the efficiency of this system? So I think what's difficult um, normally with these problems is to determine what is the useful energy and what is the total energy. Now in this problem, it might not be so confusing, but I'll present you another one after where maybe you're gonna find that it's not as clear cut. So I have 2000 joules and I have 500 joules. Obviously, the amount that does work, that, you know, the amount of energy that did work should be a smaller amount than my total energy. So you don't even need to think here. 500 is gonna go on top and 2000 should go underneath. And if you think, if you read the words carefully, it says, the stove supplied 2,000 joules to a pot. So you well know that when you put a pot of water on the stove, there's heat that kind of flows from the stove to the sides. If you put your hands near the stove, even if you're not anywhere close to the pot, you still feel some heat. So there's some heat that doesn't go into the water. So this has to be the total amount of energy, both uh, that did work and that was dissipated in the room. The 500 joules would be what went directly in the water, so what actually boiled the water, so the part that did the work. So if we calculate the efficiency, actually, let me just delete it. So we will have, if we replace, the amount of work is on top and the total energy is at the bottom. So 500 over 2000 is equal to my energy efficiency per 100%, so as a, as a percentage. So if we do the calculation, we get 25%. So we would do essentially 500 times 100 divided by 2000, and I get 25. Okay, so that one is pretty straightforward. Now, if we take a look at the second example, so I have an electric blender is 90% efficient and uses 20 kilojoules of electrical energy in a certain amount of time um, to do its job. So how much heat energy does it produce in that period? So you've got to be careful. There's two things here. So they're asking you for heat energy. So essentially they're asking you how much energy dissipated in the room. How much did not do any work? What was the excess? The other question you need to ask yourself, it uses 20, kilojoules of energy in a certain amount of time. Is this the total amount of energy or is this the energy that did the work? The way it's worded, 
one could interpret it as it's the total amount of energy, okay? So they're asking you out of the 20, so the 20 would go over here, if it's 90% efficient, well then how much energy was kind of lost to the environment? So this requires a little bit more math, a little bit of algebra, so let's take a look. So we have 90%. We know that the total energy is 20 kilojoules, so we can first calculate how much uh, is the useful energy. So we find 18 kilojoules, right? So we cross multiply again, 20 times 90 divided by 100. It gives me my useful energy. So I know that 18 kilojoules out of 20 performed work. Well, if 18 out of 20 performed work, what are we left with? There's two kilojoules that did not perform any work. So in other words, it was dissipated into the room in the form of heat. So that's the amount of heat that was quote unquote lost, that wasn't useful, okay? So you have to be careful when you read those problems to make sure that you really look at the words to see what are they really saying. This is the total amount of energy, don't get confused. Now another thing I wanna point out is that the unit was in kilojoules. So you could have done this two ways. You could have put 20,000 joules over here, or you could keep, as I did here, the units in kilojoules, as long as you remember that at the end, your answer will also be in kilojoules. So you don't necessarily need to convert um, as long as you remember to keep the same units. Okay, so that's it for this lesson. Uh, I hope it was clear. You know what to do if you have questions. And I hope to see you around for your next lesson. And in the meantime, Take care.